Um, the reading today is from Habakkuk um, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed before his hand, where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed in his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. But he marches on forever. I saw the tents of Cushion in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? You covered your bow, you called for many arrows, you split the earth with rivers, the mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by the, uh, the deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear, you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trample the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard and my heart pounded, my lips quavered at the sound, decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation evading us. Th though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the sheepfold and no cattle in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Pray in a second before we come back to that reading. So I'll give you a chance to sort of turn there or to swipe there. However you do that. But I'm under instructions. Um, to, to also give a notice of we've done up um, some children's boxes uh, for each of the children for Christmas a few little sort of uh, goodies gifts in there um, so we thought probably the best way of distributing those is that the children's ministry leaders give them to parents guardians so I'm just reminding you sort of parents guardians as you go out to, to go and to collect one of those and then what you do with that from there on out is is your problem sorry <laughs> uh, but yeah we don't, we don't want to be accused of just having sort of plied your kids with all sorts of sugar and then you know <laughs> playing up for you uh, there we go uh, why don't we pray and then we'll, we'll come to that reading again Father God thank you for your word to us Father we thank you as, as John began the service this morning there's a sense sometimes isn't there, of, of, of darkness of lostness of silence and we've seen something of that for Habakkuk, that there's moments and there's times, and there's seasons in which we feel as though our cries to you, Lord, just bounce off the walls and we just get nothing back. But Lord, we thank you that your word here, even in recording Habakkuk's experience, tells us that that's not so, that you give us your word to know who you are, to know what you've done, to know who you've made us to be and to know how we should live in light of that. Father, we thank you that you haven't left us alone. You're not silent. And so, Lord, as we come to your word, we ask that you would speak to us. Spirit, I pray that you might minister through these words to us. That, Lord, you might take the words that I've prepared and speak through me, I pray this morning, to do your work within us, to mold us and to shape us into your image, that we might be your faithful people. For your glory we ask it. Amen. Let's 
you'll find it uh, helpful to try and keep that reading there in front of you. One of the things I hope that you'll have seen over the course of this short little book, and this morning will be our, our sort of concluding of our journey through Habakkuk, is that this is a very different book. This is a book in which we see the prophet of God not so much in their public ministry, but in a private wrestling with God until this closing prayer, where it seems that actually we might now see the prophet in their public ministry. The other books of prophecy, this is the, the prophet's sort of recorded declarations to the people that's given publicly. They're sort of sermons, if you will. But Habakkuk has been different, and it's interesting to look at for that reason. But it's worth just having a little recap of what we've seen just before we sort of come to this concluding uh, message. What we've seen here is that the people of God have seen the end of the faithful King Josiah, the king who is recorded, you know, elsewhere as having rediscovered the law and the word of God and, and uh, led the people in repentance and turning back to that and reshaping and reorienting life around the word of God. He's gone in 609 BC, and in his place has been replaced with King Jehoiakim, a puppet king, really, installed by the Egyptians, who leads the people back to abandon God and to worship other gods. There's some of the context. And in chapter 1, we see Habakkuk's wrestle with God. And it asks the question, what will you do about the faithlessness of the people of God? What will God do about that? There's frustration. There's frustration for Habakkuk at being the messenger of God who has heard no message from God. There's frustration at God's patience and grace when he desires God's justice to come. And yet God promises he'll raise up Babylon to bring about his judgment and his justice to the people. There's frustration, again, at God's justice uh, when he wants to see God's grace. And yet, Habakkuk has the humility to wait to hear more. That's how that chapter ends, isn't it? And then in chapter 2, 1 to 5, we see that the one who is made righteous shall live. That God's justice against unrighteousness, against the injustice of humanity, is fair. And yet, the question we're left to ask in those passages is, what hope is there for me if I'm guilty of that? Well, the hope is, chapter 2, verse 4, that God will make them righteous through a coming salvation. That the one who lives in faith, that God has made them righteous, shall live. That the one who lives out their faith, that God has made them righteous, shall live. And then last week we looked at that section on that judgment in verses 6 to 20 of chapter 2. And we saw God's judgment on the wicked. We see that God is a God of justice. And that's central to his love, is that he is just. A love that isn't just is no love at all. We see there's this coming judgment on the wicked who've rebelled against God, who suppress and oppress other people. But the hope is that God, through Jesus, will provide a way by which he delivers justice, yes, but that he makes us righteous and delivers us. The hope, you might have read the verses last week and think, this is pretty hopeless, <laughs> because actually the more you think about it, the more it implicates more people. You know, I think the original hearers would hear it and think, yeah, can definitely see Babylon in it, but give it five more minutes and they may have seen themselves in it. And then you may be sat there and think, well, what hope is there for anyone? The hope is that God would deliver justice by making us righteous and delivering us. That because the weight of the curse of sin will be poured out upon Jesus instead of us, we can have hope that we won't face that judgment see we've seen that faith and that frustration that tension between God's grace and his justice and now in this last chapter we see submission and rejoicing and remember the center point of the whole book 
is that one little verse, that one little sentence. The righteous shall live by faith. Or the one who by faith is righteous shall live. And that's wrapped up in the coming of a person. A person who, though he may seem delayed, will surely come and achieve this. The book is desperately crying out for and, and foreshadowing Jesus' is coming. And to hence us exploring Habakkuk in Advent. Because that's really what this book is all about. What they saw in a glass dimly. What they could see shadows of. We, through the lens of the New Testament, can see clearly it's all about Jesus. So firstly, I just want to show you there a song out of sadness in those first three verses. Percy Shelley, uh, poet, uh, writes this poem to a skylark. We look before and after and pine for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. Our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thoughts. And here is a song that is birthed out of great sadness. It's called here for us a prayer, but it's more like a psalm. And you'll see that in the way that it's arranged even on the page, that it's arranged as if it's poetry, arranged as if it's metric. And you have the little indication at the end there to the choir master with stringed instruments that this would have been set to music. This is a song. Habakkuk, as said before, was likely a temple prophet. And at this point, those who served as prophets in the temple were frequently also musicians and worship leaders too. So in response to all that Habakkuk has wrestled with and the people along with him, and we've said that it's happened really over a course of time. There's a gap between even chapters 1 to 2 to 3 of a wait. Habakkuk's response to all of that is this song, the prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shiganoth. Unlike the sort of private cries of chapters 1 to 3, this now is a public declaration. Because it wasn't only Habakkuk struggling with not hearing God and with not understanding God's word when it does come. Habakkuk's a representative and a messenger of the people. A people who would have no more understood than him. Who would have been no less frustrated than Habakkuk himself. And so Habakkuk writes this song to shape, to align the hearts of the people. To know how to respond to God. It is liturgy. That's why to some extent we most weeks have some sort of form of liturgy, some sort of prayer and approach to God, which is really shaping you and telling you what to think as you approach God. Because you, if you're anything like me, and you are, you don't know what to think as you walk in on a Sunday morning. You've had a whole week, six days, 22 hours of goodness knows what else. And as we come before God, we, our hearts need shaping again and orienting in the right direction. And so Habakkuk writes this song to shape the hearts of others. So there's two th simple things we see here. Music is instrumental, pun intended, in shaping hearts. Music is instrumental in shaping people's hearts. And secondly, the thing to say is, some of you are creative. Some of you are musicians. How might you possibly be able to help shape and serve us in shaping our hearts in song? See, the resolution of the frustration here and the expression of faith that comes from Habakkuk comes through a song. Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, says this of music. He says, we can mention only one point which experience confirms, namely that next to the word of God, music deserves the highest praise. She is mistress and governess of those human emotions, which as masters govern men, or more often overwhelm them. For whether you wish to comfort the sad, to terrify the happy, to encourage the despairing, to humble the proud, to calm the passionate, or to appease those full of hate, what more effective means than music could you find? 
And we find that culture does this too. Culture uses music to shape and align the hearts. Culture uses music in a liturgical way like this. There's the songs of our culture that don't just reflect the views, the values, the loves, the hopes, the fears of our culture. They shape them. It's like advertising. Advertising does not present to you what you want. It redefines what you want. That's the whole point. Those people don't make that kind of money because they just reflect back what you already wanted. No. They're masters. Reshaping what it is you want in the first place. Yeah, there's an old album now, so everything to me that's kind of contemporary is in the 90s because, you know, I'm a child of the 90s, but it's old now. There's an album by The Verve called Urban Hymns. You know, all songs really are hymns just as much. They're not declared or dedicated to God, of course, and they're not directed towards him, but they're no less hymns. They're songs that shape your hopes, your aspirations, your affections. So, there's a need, isn't there? One, to actually listen to those kind of songs, those urban hymns, to understand our world. You want to understand what our world really thinks and feels and believes, listen to its liturgy. But secondly, there's a need to value the ongoing development of our own hymnary that reflects the truth, the beauty of the gospel, to shape the heart in melodies and rhythms that grab our hearts, songs that are in our language, our melodies, from our context, from among our people, just as Habakkuk does here. It's a song According to Shigianoth, we're told, that is a, a wild, a passionate song, we're told, with rapid changes of rhythm. This is a song that is, simply put, creative. It's interesting to listen to. It's used in one other place in the Old Testament, in Psalm 7, verse 1, uh, which is, uh, we're told is a, uh, a psalm of David which he sang. And the word that's used for sang is the same word, Shigianoth. That is, it's a song that's wild and passionate with all these exciting, interesting changes of rhythm and tempo. And then let's look at the content of this song here. It says, I've heard the report of you and your work. Do I fear? He fears the report of him and his work. That is the revelation that God has given in the first two chapters there. And now what does Habakkuk resolve to do? Well, he resolves to submit to God's wisdom. We're told that God is working in the midst of of the years, in the midst of the years, revive it, in the midst of the years, make it known. When? When is Habakkuk asking for this to happen? It's been two judgments that God has given. He said that he's raising up Babylon actually to judge the people of God so that they would be refined and so that they would come back to God instead of worshipping false idols that uh, not only is it offending God in that he has said for them to worship him and they're not, but it's also causing all of this harmful ethical sort of result within the people of God. It's causing all of these harmful behaviors to one another, humanly speaking, also. And God has said there is a judgment coming there. But then the second layer of judgment is that one against the wicked, which is coming then further down the line, that even that people that God will raise up for that purpose, for that time, will one day be judged themselves. And we know historically that actually in this period, Babylon actually only rose to ascendancy for 70 years. And then they were gone. And it happens time and time again. But so when is it that Habakkuk thinks God will work? Well, commentator o. Palmer Robertson writes this. He says, most likely the midst of the years refers to the time between the two acts of judgment revealed to Habakkuk in the process of his earlier dialogue. In the time between the purging judgment that must fall on the house of God itself and the consuming judgment that must avenge God's elect in that crucial period before the destruction of God's enemies. It's a really clever way of telling you now. In the period somewhere between the judgment of the people of Babylon that comes and then goes and the final judgment at the close of the ages the place in which we 
stand just as much as Habakkuk and the people of God did then. In the midst of the years, revive your work. Renew it. And this is the time to sing this song for God's people. He says, revive it. Make it known. He says two uh, different connected things. It's to revive it, to make it literally come to life. We heard earlier about that promise uh, of God to come. It was understood by rabbis and Old Testament tradition and then by the New Testament authors that what was being uh, spoken of here was a person. That's why the, the writer to Hebrews puts it that way. Paul puts it that way in the New Testament. That though the vision may tarry, but they see the vision as being a person, though he may tarry, he will surely come. Revive it, make it come to life, make it be known. It may well be that even the Apostle John in his gospel has this very verse in mind in John chapter 1. John introduces his gospel by sharing not Jesus' earthly family tree, but his heavenly origins. And he may well have had this very verse in mind. Because he's saying the two same things. That Jesus is coming to bring to life God's promise and to make God known. John chapter 1 verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory. The focus is that Jesus has made God come alive before people. What is previously could only be best described as a concept is living before us. And then in verse 18, he says, No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. And the words that's used by John, there's made him graspable. That all of a sudden, in Jesus, coming here to earth in flesh, it's like it's put a handle upon God for you. That there's something to grab hold of, to understand him. Previously, the best way that you could really describe him was to say, he is that which no greater than can be conceived of. I've told you of it before, it's a fantastic piece of theology and yet fantastically disappointing because it tells you nothing other than he's better than whatever it was you could have thought of him as. But now Jesus tells you something so much better because Jesus is what we're looking to. A, a man, a person before you. He comes to make God's promise living and to make it graspable, to make it known. What came from Taman, we're told, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. And the two place names will probably mean absolutely zero to you. But what the prophet is doing is retracing the journey of the Exodus into the Promised Land. That God previously had been with them and seen them through all through that treacherous journey. And so he's saying, Lord, revive it again. As we find ourselves on a journey between two kingdoms, caught in the time in between, in the midst of the years in which we're citizens of the earth, sort of, but citizens of heaven too. Come and revive and make known your work. He tells us here that God's splendor had covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. His glory has spanned not just their neighborhood, but the cosmos. This journey of faith and frustration for Habakkuk culminates in this song. And the theme is right there in verse 3, God's splendor. So let's look to the bulk of this song here in verses 4 to 15. Firstly, we've seen a song out of sadness. Secondly, the real theme of this song here is that what he has done, he will do again. The main point of the song comes in two sections. We see the splendor, the glory of God there in verses 4 to 7. And then we see God as the victorious warrior in verses 8 to 15. And if you pay sort of very close attention, you might also notice as well that in those first verses 4 to 7, uh, Habakkuk is speaking in the past tense, God's past actions, and that from verses 8 to 15, Habakkuk changes and is now actually directly 
addressing God himself. So firstly, the splendor of the Lord that we see there. Habakkuk shows us God's splendor in four different ways. Firstly, in light. His brightness was like the light, rays flashed from his hand. God in his coming is like the bursting forth of light. We read similar imagery in 2 Samuel chapter 22 in a song celebrating David's victory over Saul and his enemies. And the point is what God has done before, he will do again. John begins his gospel as well, doesn't he, by saying that the coming of Jesus has seen the inbreaking of light. Chapter 1 verse 5, that light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. God shows his glory, his splendor, firstly in light, secondly in plague. Before him, verse 5 here, went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. Habakkuk is remembering the Exodus plagues. As great as the power of Babylon to oppress is, and as great as the power for Egypt before them to oppress them, God's power to command the cosmos is far superior. Habakkuk remembers back to the story of the Exodus. And those great plagues that helped the people of God come out of the land of darkness and into the freedom of being able to worship God and ask that it would happen again. We see his greatness in light, in plague, and thirdly, in his uh, control. Look at verse 6. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered, the everlasting hills sunk low. What we know to be utterly beyond us, all of those things, to measure the earth, to shake the nations, to scatter mountains, to make hills sink low, utterly beyond humanity. What we know to be utterly beyond us, that controlling of the earth, of the elements he can do. All the earth and all living upon the earth are under the power of God so that what seems immovable is not for him. And then look at, fourthly, the way he overwhelms his enemies here. Verse 7, I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. And now it zeroes in to what Habakkuk and the people would have been most concerned with. That's their enemies around them that encircle them, that overwhelm them, that have overtaken them. To offer hope that God will overcome them. You see, what he has done, he will do again. And then we see here in verses 8 to 15, the Lord, the victorious warrior, and now Habakkuk changes his tone and his perspective to address God himself, not just his works. He says, was your anger against the rivers? Was your anger uh, against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses on your chariot of salvation? God intervened to save his people at the Red Sea. Was he really angry with the sea as he parted it? will answer us in a minute but there's a shift here given away in that language you God has now presenced himself with Habakkuk for this section the God who has seen silent who has seemed absent is now before Habakkuk as he speaks with him you strip the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. God is this mighty warrior for his people, riding out to save them. Again, John gives us something of a picture of Jesus fulfilling this in Revelation. That Jesus will come as one riding on a horse, with a name across his leg, with a sword in his hand, 
He'll come as a returning warrior king to take back his kingdom and to avenge his people, to bring justice. You split the earth with rivers, mountains saw you and writhed. This is no ordinary warrior, though. He has command of the elements. Look at that. The sun and moon stand still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped at the flash of your glittering spear. Just as God held the sun and the moon to allow Joshua to complete the conquest of the land, he will do again what Habakkuk is reminding himself, reminding the people of, reminding us of again is what he has done he will do again. And so now verses 12 to 13 answer that rhetorical question. Was your anger against the rivers? You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. He was saving his people. He wasn't angry with the creation, but he was saving his people. You went out for the salvation of your people, not for destruction's sake. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. The Savior crushes his, our adversary. This promise of salvation has two elements. One, there's this Savior who will deliver us. But that doesn't come apart from the Savior who will crush the adversary. What he has done, he'll do again. He will fulfill his promise to crush the head of Satan in Jesus. Satan, the head of the wicked. The promise given way back in Genesis 3 that one will come born of woman who will crush the head of the serpent. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. What he has done, he will do again. And then lastly, we see Habakkuk's closing response. At the end of all of this, what will he do? How will he respond? And we see that there's joy in the wait. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. There's Habakkuk's summary of his feelings at what God's revealed here. That there's on the one hand fear at his power and his majesty. And yet patience to wait for it my body trembles his lips quiver rottenness enters the bones legs tremble beneath him this is a message that's affected him because if what God says is really true it it is awesome not in the way in which that word's been devalued but in the true sense of it that it is awesome awe-inspiring, that it leaves you speechless, that as other people will put it, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's actually not comfortable to be before him because there's a power differential. If what God says is really true, it is awesome. And so I think there's a question there for us, isn't there? If we're honest, how often do we really feel in awe of what God says and does? Maybe if the answer to that question is not very often, that may reflect that there is some doubts as to the truth of his word. Because if you're convinced you're in awe. My body trembles, lips quiver, 
Rottenness enters my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. And yet, I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Despite not seeing this, he trusts God will deliver them. In fact, for the next coming years after Habakkuk has this vision, it's not going to look very good for him at all. Because actually the power uh, and the ascendancy of Babylon is going to grow and to grow and to grow. And he is going to look like a fool. As those before him. He's going to look as foolish as Noah building an ark in the middle of a drought. He's going to look as foolish as Moses thinking that he could lead this uh, rowdy sort of rabble of, of refugees out of the world's superpower Egypt. It's going to look as ridiculous as Abraham leaving the city and the land in which he dwelt and worked and had a living and had his family and had respect to go to a city that he does not know. Habakkuk will look foolish because for many years they will not see the fulfillment of this promise. They will not see this deliverance and yet he trusts God will deliver them. At the song's crescendo here, Habakkuk leaves us with three anchors for the people of faith waiting for his coming. Firstly, it's about contentment. Look at verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock will be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I'll rejoice in the Lord. There's contentment. Even if everything falls apart, still he will rejoice in the Lord. This is, and throughout this chapter, Habakkuk's been drawing back on that imagery from the Exodus. This is the opposite of that wilderness unfaithfulness. You know, in the wilderness, despite the fact that God did not abandon them, that he did not forsake them, that their clothing and their footwear did not wear through, that every day he actually did provide for their daily bread, they regularly abandoned God. Because rather than waiting for God to deliver his promises, they sought out gods who offered them riches now, who offered them comfort, path of least resistance, They never delivered on it, and they never do. But it's the same message today. And we can look back at them and we can think, oh, how stupid. Worshipping a totem pole. Worshipping a golden calf. It's real easy to look at it, oh, I wouldn't be too convinced by that. But it's always the story behind the God. It's always the same story, but it's always that story behind the God. The the image is just the symbol. Really, don't think that you're that much cleverer than people before. This this narrative we have today of constant progression, what a load of nonsense. (laughs) What a load of nonsense. Read a bit more history. It's, It's not true, is it? It's the story behind the God. And the story always is, why wait? Why wait on a God who you're not seeing, on a promise you don't yet see delivered? Sacrifice to me. You have it now. Don't you want to be happy now? Might not be a golden calf that tempts you. Could be the idol of Korea. Sacrifice to Korea and you'll have everything you ever thought you wanted. You have all the meaning and purpose and standing that you always thought you needed so desperately. We'll offer you that. It won't deliver. You'll you'll find yourself lonelier, sadder, more disconsolate than you ever thought imaginable at the end of realizing it didn't deliver what it offered. It'll do it time and time again. Use me and you can feel good now you don't need to wait to feel good from a god who's not delivering for you just now use me 
You can feel good now. You can feel alive. It's always the story, isn't it? It's the story behind alcohol, drugs, sex, gambling. Just one more hit of this to feel good, to feel alive. And it never delivers. You feel worse. You feel shameful. You feel more empty. You feel that you need more and more the next time to be able to feel something. People's approval. You think that I'll reshape all my life to get other people's approval because that's what I really need. I just need people to love me. Need to know that people respect me. Need to know that people think I'm always sort of doing the right thing and you'll find yourself constantly frustrated. Even when people do, you don't trust it. (laughs) And when 99 people do, the one person who doesn't eats you up from the inside out. It's always the same story. It doesn't have to be a golden calf. It doesn't have to be a tree. But don't think you're any less susceptible. Or me either for that matter. But here is contentment. Even if everything should fall apart, still I will rejoice. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there should be no herd in the stalls, yet I'll rejoice in the Lord. And make no bones about it, that's, you know, artistic language. But what it's describing is that moment, and you, like me, may perhaps have experienced those moments in life where literally the floor falls in on life. Everything falls apart. Literally nothing is working. In that moment, yet I'll rejoice. There's contentment, firstly. Secondly, there's joy. Look at verse 18. Yet I'll rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Even in the midst of present trials, he finds joy in God. Which is good, because everything else is lost. Everything else that he might have wanted to put joy in is gone. And so he finds it in God. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. As tough as things may get, God saves us. And in that we take joy. But look at the way he puts it. In the God of my salvation. He puts it in a sort of completed sense. It isn't yet. But he trusts that it will be. Because of who it is. What he's done, he'll do again. There's contentment, there's joy, and then lastly, there's strength. Look at that in verse 19. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Even in the midst of great pain and trial here that Habakkuk describes, that will happen for the people of God. It's not just artistic language. That, that, they really do live through that. That's great pain and trial. Yet, even within it, he finds his strength to endure in God himself. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Habakkuk ends by resolving to find contentment, joy, and strength in God, despite the storms he's living through. You might be sitting there and thinking, how do we find joy in the wait? Because that's the real sort of practical question, isn't it? Well, you know, what about us? Do we find ourselves in that place, don't we? It's utterly beyond you, isn't it? You might feel that too. Well, that's the one. How do we find it? Because it feels as though that's kind of utterly beyond me. Yes. Yes, it is. God grants it. The God who makes you righteous grants you joy in the wait if you'll look to him. Habakkuk over the course of this book, has explored that sort of frustration of needing both God's justice and his grace and feeling as though at every point you got the one that you didn't want at that moment. And God promises to provide an answer. That he'll bring a judgment that brings his people back and that he'll provide salvation for them from it. 
that God promises to provide an answer to this struggle between justice and grace in a person who is to come and to save us. That Jesus comes and in order to face the full force of God's justice being brought about upon all of the sin and unrighteousness of humanity in order to also express the fullness of his grace towards us by having made us righteous. Jesus is the answer to this prophecy. Not only to come, but to come and to resolve that tension. Justice and grace that meted out upon Jesus is the wrath of God towards all the sin of mankind to resolve that need of God to bring justice and yet the grace of God that the full force and weight of that is met upon Jesus and not you that you may go free that your hope is not in yourself it's not in the strength of your faith your faith is expressing your trust in God's declaration that in Jesus you are made righteous because though you are sinful and though you deserve this judgment of God too, just like the Babylonians, just like the Israelites, we're no better, not one of us. Different poisons perhaps, but no better. The full force of that met on Jesus instead of us. So that the hope at the end of all of this is Jesus coming and Jesus facing this and Jesus giving himself for us that we be made right. That the one who by faith is righteous shall live. Let's pray. Father God, we Thank you for this glorious little book and the amazing truths that it expresses that we've journeyed through and that we know all too well. We know, like Habakkuk and Israel, what it is to live in a land that is filled with deep, deep injustices and wickedness in, in so many different ways and at different levels. We know what that feels like. We know what it feels like in different ways to, like Habakkuk, be crying out, Lord, when will you bring your justice to bear here? When will you overthrow the wicked and bring righteousness and justice and mercy and peace and love? And yet we also know that place of desperation, of in the midst of your judgment, asking, Lord, when will you bring your grace when will you remember mercy? We know what it's like to speak to you and to feel as though we don't always hear very much back. We know what it's like to hear from you and to not understand, to not really be able to wrap our minds or our hearts around what it is you do say. We know those feelings. Lord, I thank you for this glorious truth revealed in this book that we'll begin to explore as we think through Advent over the next few weeks of Jesus coming as the answer to this prophecy, the answer to your promises to come and to face the full weight of your judgment and justice that we might feel and experience the full wonders of your grace towards us that through Jesus having offered yourself for us, righteous, spotless, perfect offering, our sin is atoned for. All of the depth of our sin and shame is met by this bursting forth of life that over, like that overcomes darkness before it. And so Lord, we thank you that the hope this morning is not to do better, to try harder. The hope is not to sit here and wait for the judgment on all those nasty other people out there because we're so much better. The hope is 
that you have made us right. That by faith we can live. And Lord, I pray for each person here, whatever they may be going through and feeling and thinking at this moment, whatever their story might look like just now, that Holy Spirit, you will bring the truth and the reality and the beauty of that to bear in their heart, to know that we are made righteous through Christ. And so through faith, we can live. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your loving kindness and grace and humility and mercy and compassion that you would be willing to come and to live and to die for us that we might know you that we might be set free spirit just pray you please uh, let us know that so deeply in in our own hearts i pray amen um I think we're going to sing again in just a couple of moments. I'll just give you one final plug as well for the carol service tonight. Six o'clock tonight at Blend. It would be great to see you if you're able to come out. There is a physical sign-up sheet just out there on the table. So if doing it on computers and stuff is kind of hard for you, to, no problem. There is a BIC pen out there and a piece of paper, and you can do it the analog way if you like. It'd be really great to see. We've paid for you to be able to have like hot drinks and cakes and stuff as well, so don't feel like maybe the worry about spending the money might put you off because that's all kind of sorted for you. It'd be great to have you, and we will just journey through the sort of story together through carols and those readings. That's me done. <laughs>